All right, let's come back to the seat. I, I like the buzz. Let me say that. I mean, we can't let the buzz continue, but I like the buzz. <laughs> I, I like the fact that there's a lot of dialogue around what's happening here. People are chatting up. I, I found it interesting that a lot of my conversations weren't just about talking with people I haven't seen for a while, but we're actually talking about ideas that we had to take some notes on to make sure that it doesn't get lost. So if you can take a seat. I am delighted to introduce our uh, session chair. Good friend who Please <laughs> welcome uh, Dr. Shadamay Rose. <laughs> Good afternoon, colleagues, all protocols having been observed during the course of the day. Uh, we've been having a wonderful day. I spent most of it online um, after my class this morning, and so I was enjoying the excellent presentations, the content, and I know that this afternoon we have three more. Um, that will continue in the same vein. Focusing on mitigation um, within the mining sector, uh, a critical element in the management, even as the conference seeks to look at mining and its environmental and human health side. Um, and so we're going to hear a little bit more about that this afternoon, and I want to encourage you to keep those uh, four key um, areas in mind as we go through this afternoon's session. Uh, standardization of methods, um, our community empowerment, uh, how we convert all of this fantastic knowledge um, into policy, and uh, what is, are the next steps in terms of research and innovation. And we've already heard quite a number of uh, areas of opportunity for research and innovation, and I'm sure we'll hear some more uh, this afternoon. Moving right on with our, our session, we're going to have three presentations. Um, lessons from the Responsible Mining Initiative in Guyana, and that's going to be done for us by Rene Edwards, who is the Technical Director for Conservation International Guyana. And he's also a part of Deshaun Billings he's co as a consultant. We're going to hear an overview of mercury free mining in Guyana from Ms. Shemiza Tom, who is a mineral processing engineer from the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission. And we're going to wrap up the session looking at mainstreaming mine reclamation and closure through education and awareness. A CAP approach, and that will be done for us by Godfrey Scott a senior environmental officer, also at the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission. They will come one after the other, and we will follow that up with our, our questions uh, and responses. So I invite Mr. Rennie Edwards to the podium. Right, good afternoon. Thank you, Shana May, my schoolmate from high school. I think from fourth to fifth form. So it is really nice to be here with you. I just want Deshaun and Colin to just raise their hand. Because while I'm doing the presentation, this is, those are two of my colleagues who we worked at CI. Um, so I'll just quickly jump right into it. Um, so one of the things we want to do, I think we've had today uh, a lot of presentations that are really important on research and the academic side. And I think we've really, really interesting research being done at the university and by other institutions like IRD. Um, we just heard a really great a set of great work being done by the GFC and you know the unit that Rihanna is part of. We know that that unit is really a world. They do really world class work. And we heard from Stefan just now and the organizing framework. We're shifting gears a little bit, and this presentation, and I think. Both Shamiza and Godfrey, if I could speak on their behalf, is really very much about the practice and how we are applying a lot of the science and the 
research that's been done, not just here in Guyana, but globally, including things like knowledge, attitudes, and practices surveys, to actual practice on the ground. So I just wanted to give it that frame. Um, so the work we're doing, and, and the, the title of the presentation is really the Responsible Mining Initiative, um, and lessons from that Responsible Mining Initiative. And the work we're doing at Conservation International Guyana is in partnership, and the Responsible Mining Initiative is actually made up of different entities, including the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission, a very important partner with us because they bring a lot of the practical on the ground work, they have their connections with miners, and they have a lot of field stations, they have a lot of people who have uh, a strong technical and science background. But we also work with the private sector, the Guyana uh, Gold and Diamond Miners Association, the Guyana Women Miners Association, the EPA, WWF, Ministry of Natural Resources, and the National Tushaus Council representing indigenous communities. So this uh, initiative really has four key areas. And we've touched on these areas today, but I'm just going to give a brief overview of what they are. The first one is about exploration or prospecting, and this is really in gold mining at all scales, about really going where the gold is. It's finding where the commercially viable deposits of gold, where they're located, and being able to mine those areas. And what that does, it makes sure, we'll hear in a moment, it makes sure that you make sure that we don't actually damage the forest or damage ecosystems, but we're maximizing returns. The second part is around mineral processing, Shemiz will go more into detail with that. We also have Deshaun and Colin here. And that's been able, to, that, that second uh, mineral processing is around making sure you get the gold out of the deposits or the areas where you're going. In Guyana, we have very, very poor recovery rates, sometimes 30%. So we get 30% of the gold out of the ore that we're actually processing. Um, and really is about doing that in a way that reduces the use of mercury and hopefully eliminating mercury where feasible. And of course, the uh, reclamation or restoration of mined out sites. And the fourth part of this initiative is around markets. So really, really trying to find a premium price or a premium price for gold that is being produced in a responsible way. So these, this is how we've tried to organize our work around responsible mining in these four areas. Restoration, uh, sorry, prospecting, Mineral, mineral processing, restoration or rehabilitation, and market. And the presentation really will try to frame it in that way. One of the important things that, we've, um, that we've have to, we have to focus on in actual doing responsible mining work is really identifying the areas where we actually are going to work. So those sites, and we've heard today about demonstration, we heard from Darcy about this idea of actually demonstrating responsible mining initiatives because miners will only change the behavior towards those responsible mining practices when it makes sense for them economically and makes practical sense. Feas it's feasible for them to do it. No one is going to change their behavior and use mining technology or mining equipment when it don't make sense to them because they're going to lose money and then they're in the sauce. So one of the key things is really identifying those areas where we're going to actually do the mining demonstrations, do the training, and so on. And those partners on the ground, identifying those miners. And these are some of the selection criteria we use. Important to understand for us is obviously things like land tenure. So they have to be owning, they have to own the land. They can't be mining illegally. Um, they have to be influencers, so people who other miners would listen to. So these are really established miners. You know, we have, they have to be able to acknowledge people. And we really also are working with areas that we are not removing primary forests. So areas that have already been um, developed. So that's a very key first step in the process, being able to uh, have good selection criteria for those sites. So in, in our project, we've worked on, in four areas. So our primary area where we've worked really is around Maria, well, the, the key areas, Maria and around Karau, where we've had active demonstration sites. But we've also attempted demonstration sites in Peruni and in the Northwest, which weren't so successful. 
um, and we'll just go through quickly uh, some of the experiences from our pro the process that we've employed. So one of the key things is, and you see Kaichoa Falls, we had some research being presented earlier um, by Benita and others about work around Kaichoa, is the approach that we've really, uh, we've taken really is a landscape approach. Because one of the things is that while mining occurs at a specific site or a specific location, the effects of mining, obviously, as we've been hearing earlier, through species or, or you know, through the air, it has an effect in the broader landscape. So when we talk about Madia for this particular site, Madia, as we know, is connected, obviously, through the Pataro River to Kaichoa Falls and to indigenous communities like Campbelltown, Maikobi, Morawa, Princeville, that are around the Madia area. And for this particular site, we worked with a, uh, a miner in a place called New Jack City, but we also worked with the village of Campbelltown. And for both the village and the uh, individual miner, it involved planning. So what you're seeing here is the result of a village sustainability plan, a 10-year plan that we did with Campbelltown Village. And this is the land, uh, land use or uh, land allocation map from the village. And just as we've heard earlier about the SDGs, this 10-year planning process really prioritizes uh, the village's vision and activities, and it's grouped a lot in, in six different areas, health, education, environment, uh, governance, nature and, cult nature and environment, culture, and livelihood. And here you could see some of the key priority activities, including responsible mining, agriculture, etc. So that land use approach, where you're trying to organize these activities within a specific village or a specific site, how do you locate mining within this, becomes important. And also, how does mining contribute, not just to put in some money in individuals' pockets, but also benefiting the wider society. So when we talk about community empowerment, it's really about how do you minimize the impacts of mining and, uh, and also maximize the benefits that come from it. So that's it in Campbelltown. This gold and areas which do not have gold. And this will oh. restrict the mining in areas which do not have gold. And mm. Try again. So this is a... And that will help the miner by not putting except the cost on um, mining an area which does not have any gold, which would also preserve the forest in terms of that it's not cut down and deforested for any reason. GGMC and GGDMA was really to do a research on prospecting to show the different methods of prospecting and what could work and what can't work um, in terms of um, finding those areas with commercially viable deposits of gold. Another important part of what we're doing in mineral processing is actually set doing, selecting the right type of equipment for the type of ore or the material within a particular area. And this is a flow sheet from the site that we did in Region 8. But really making sure that we have this practically testing this equipment. Shamiz will go into more detail and having this information available for the miners in, when, uh, in terms of how they select their equipment. This is a quick look at um, you know, the, the particular <laughs> One other um, area, and these are some examples of material that we've developed for the miners, equipment booklets and booklets on prospecting. This is an example of a flush drill, which is a piece of prospecting equipment. If we look quickly at the marketing side of this, one of the things that we did is the responsibly mined gold produced at a mine and passed through a system that is traceable, so where there is traceability. We've worked with the miner, GGMC, and the Guyana Gold Board to establish a, a system where mine was, uh, gold was produced at the mine, so Mr. Chris Alfonso's mine, as I mentioned, in New Jack City, 
and sold to the gold board with the idea that this is then uh, bought by a jeweler in Georgetown and could produce jewelry that would be able, that we would be able to trace this gold right back to the mine. So this was a test case. So it had some hiccups. In the end, we weren't able to get the, well, the gold got to the gold board, but the, the jeweler was in it. Topaz actually wasn't able to actually produce jewelry. But this year, we're actually exploring how we could actually get this done. And also, importantly, we've also registered a brand, Eldorado Gold, that will focus on actually uh, the brand for responsibly mine gold from Guyana. Uh, so this is the tra that was the traceability. This is the logo from the Eldorado Gold. Um, just finally, quickly on the restoration part, and some examples of uh, an example of what we've done with restoration. We've worked with UG, GGMC, GFC, and some other agencies, and we developed a restoration course in collaboration with the Boise State University. The course is actually run at the university, um, and we we, um, we we actually applied a restoration process to Campbelltown Village which included work done by a student from the university who I think is now pursuing a master's, Eric Stahl, on looking at biodiversity and insect diversity within Campbelltown. And we also did a restoration opportunities map for the village to identify those areas that have high potential for restoration activity. So we kind of have the science that would identify those areas, but we haven't actually done restoration in the villages yet. Um, finally, what I would say, because I got five minutes uh, notice, like five or six minutes to go, one of the other quick things in this whole process is also, while we're talking about mining, we have to uh, recognize that many people involved in the mining sector, like these women here from the Guyana Women Miners Organization, but lots of other miners, are also interested in diversifying their activities um, away from mining or and adding new activities to what they're doing. So one of the other parts of our work on responsible mining is looking for alternative livelihood activities. And we work with the Guyana Women Miners Organization to work with about 15 or 20 women that were looking to do exactly that, diversify their um, activities into areas such as tourism, poultry production, um, catering, et cetera. So that's a, that's a very important part of um, what we think is, should be part of uh, whenever we talk about mining, or even if we're talking about research in mining and in mining communities, is understanding the other value chains, the other sectors that exist within those landscapes and communities so that opportunities could be pursued to help with diversification. So the value that we get from mining could actually, uh, and the resources we get from mining, could help to build up people's asset base and their skill sets so that when those, you know, when they're ready to move on to something new or to have a, a diverse set of um, activities, they could do that. Um, in wrapping up, what I would say is that we had a lot of lessons from this process, lots of reports. Um, we have a lot of lessons on how to do demonstrations, what works, a lot of what hasn't worked. And this is information, obviously, we've worked with GGMC, GGDMA, and other partners, WWF. But from a research perspective, we're very open. We have a lot of baseline information. So for the university and for students, we're quite open to sharing this information, opening it, this up to you um, for uh, you know, people who are doing their final year projects. We're quite keen on, on seeing how we could collaborate on this. But thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. By now you have known <laughs> I'm Shemisa Tom from DGMC, and I'm here to present on an overview of mercury fee mining in Guyana. My presentation will take this outline, and let me get into the introduction. As we heard earlier, elemental mercury is used in small and medium scale gold mining in Guyana. Mercury is mixed with gold containing materials, forming a mercury gold amalgam, which is then heated. The mer oh my gosh, yes. The mer which is then heated and vaporized and the merc and the mer sorry, which is then heated, vaporized, and the merc vaporizing the mercury, sorry, to obtain gold. Could you, excuse me. Yes, thank you. Yes. The process is very dangerous and leads to significant mercury exposure and health risks if not done correctly. The Minimata Convention on Mercury, a global agreement for reducing mercury pollution, recognizes the risk of using mercury in artisanal and small scale gold mining and calls upon nations to reduce and where feasible eliminate mercury use in the sector. The Minimata Convention includes a ban on new mercury mines. So um, mercury will not be mined very soon and this will obviously bring about a shortage in the industry. The phase out of existing mercury mines. The phase out and phase down of mercury used in a number of products and the processes. Many of us may not know, but creams that we use contain mercury, especially bleaching creams that persons um, use today. Um, mercury is found in lights in our homes. Um, mercury in dental amalgam. All these things are being phased out via the Minimata Convention. Cosmetics as well, mercury in cosmetics. All of these will be phased out. Control measure on emissions to air and on releases to land and water. Contrary to popular belief, um, artisanal or, or small scale gold mining is not the only um, contribution contributor to emissions to the air. We have um, cement factories, we have coal factories as well. Even our fuel that we use may have mercury in it as well. The regulation of the informal sector of artisanal and small scale gold mining, interim storage of mercury and its disposal once it becomes waste. Restoration of sites contaminated by mercury as well as health issues. All of these, um, the Minimata Convention is calling on countries to look at all of these issues that I just highlight here. The government of Guyana signed on to the Minimata Convention on October 10, 2013, and we ratified it on September 24, the following year. Guyana has set for itself the goal of reducing mercury emissions by 55% by the year 2022, which was last year, and to eliminate mercury use by 2027, which is four years from now. The number of organizations, sorry, a number of organizations, including GGMC, have begun to plan projects that will help to reach the aforementioned deadlines. The use of mercury in small and medium scale mines. Sometimes we ask, why do small and medium scale miners still use mercury? The truth is that it is easy to use. There is no other chemical in this world that has the ability to do what mercury does with gold, right? The, 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 the bond, the connection that it forms. It's easy to use because it does not require any technical skill, right? It's relatively cheap. It's very much available. Miners are aware of the risks, but take few 
precautions because the effects are not immediate. The health um, effects are not immediate. It can be used with no or cheap machinery. It yields relatively high recovery in the medium size ranges. And it has a fast recovery process, especially compared with the use of chemical methods or even the improved mineral recovery methods. The recovery using mercury is much faster than any other method. And again, miners are permitted to use mercury during the final stage of the mineral recovery process. That is after the sluice box has been washed down and the final gold with black sands concentrate has remained in the pan. The miner should carry out this process using PPEs and burning of the amalgam should be done with the use of the retort. This is to protect the miner's health as well as to recapture the mercury that is used, preventing um, emissions to the environment. Miners are strictly per prohibited from sprinkling mercury in mining pits, placing mercury in the sluice boxes, using amalgam plates. The photo on my right there shows a miner amalgamating gold in a pan without the use of gloves, which is a dangerous practice. The sluice box. The sluice box still remains the most economical but not the most efficient concentration technique of gold recovery. This is because of its simplicity, low cost, and is easy to set up. A sluice box for a six inch dredge operation processes approximately 20 to 30 tons of material per hour, which is a relatively large volume of material compared to the modern improved techniques that we show to the miners. For those who don't know, we use, these are three common types of sluice boxes that are used in Guyana. The standard are straight sluice box, the zigzag sluice box, or the triple deck sluice box. You may have heard from Mr. Waldrum that PGMC has been introducing new techniques to miners. We introduce concentrators, centrifugal concentrators, and on my right, we have the gold catcher, which is a centrifugal concentrator being demonstrated at Ryan Sugdial's operation at Red Hill Peruni. A, the cost of a gold catcher is 3,500 US or 735,000 Guyana dollars. And it processes two to three tons per hour. So we could compare what one gold catcher would process compared to what a sluice box would process, and we would see that for a miner to process the volume a sluice box would process, they would need more than one gold catcher, right? The next, this is another centrifugal concentrator. It's the Nelson concentrator. It's just different brands, but the same, um, tech, the same technique they're using. This is much more expensive. It's um, 30,000 US dollars or 6 million Guyana dollars for one. And it comes in different sizes as well. For final recovery, we have demonstrated the blue bowl concentrator. This is practically a mechanical battle that is used in mining and it can be used at the final stage of mining so further concentrate um, a gold concentrate from a primary concentrator. The next, there is the gold cube. This is also a final recovery option. 
we have here. Um, miners have been trying or adopted, trying to adopt um, improved mineral recovery techniques in their operations. We have some miners using wash plants, some using the jig along with their sluice box, some using crushers and gravity concentrators together, some using the vibrating screen and shaking table. Here, um, this is the project that Renee was talking about that we partnered with CI to do. Um, an entire circuit was set up. So the material coming from the sluice box went to a trommel, which was a screen. The screen then sent the undersized or the smaller particle to the gold catcher. And the larger size material was crushed and then sent to the gold catcher for a gold recovery. After the gold catcher was used, the gold cube was used to further concentrate gold. And this was done in Madio at um, Mr. Christopher Alfonso's work site. We also have conveyor system being used. This is in the Northwest District. This is an icon batch concentrator, which is also a type of centrifugal concentrator. It's just a different brand, but being used at, in the Mazaruni River. We have the ball mill and Chinese concentrator as well, being used in Cayuni. Now we will talk about alternatives for using mercury in the am amalgamating of gold. Some of the alternatives that we have proposed to miners is direct smelting, whereby they can, when they, if they use these improved technology, they can directly smelt their concentrate using um, borax. Yes, thank you. Yes, using borax is one of the methods we have um, proposed to them instead of using mercury and then using borax as they would normally do. Um, cyanide leaching, as we talked about. Um, this is for larger scale miners and miners who have a plan and plan to do responsible mining. Medium scale miners may soon be able to use this, but they'll have to have a plan for storage straight to end use, how to treat their tailings and all. Leaching with other reagents like chlorine and bromine. There are so many chemical methods that can be used to recover gold, but it takes technical experts to do it. Miners will not be able to do this on their own. They will definitely have to pay technical experts to do this. And then we have gold oil agglomeration. These processes are difficult to implement in small-scale mining due to the need for a, high, a highly enriched concentrate, um, technical complexity, high cost, health, safety, and environmental problems, and the the slow process associated with it. Barriers to mercury mining. Equipment aren't locally available. This is one of the barriers we found to, um, for miners readily adapting to newer and improved technology because the equipment are not available in stores. They find it difficult to actually go online and they wouldn't go online and order. A few miners would go online and order and all these things. But if it was readily um, available in stores, we found that there would have been more adaptation. Financing for equipment purchase. Smaller miners especially complain about this. So adapt to newer and improved technology. They would need financial assistance. Some miners are reluctant to move away from the sluice box, which is not only simple but less costly than an improved mineral recovery equipment. And the need for prospecting to aid equipment selection. Since not one size fits all, equipment are site specific. So you heard about um you heard about some places only 30% of the gold is being recovered and all these things, but sometimes you need to devise a 
recovery plans and use a series of equipment so as to recover particles, gold particles of different sizes. Because you might have coarse gold and you might have the fine powder gold and you would need different equipment or different techniques to recover these. In conclusion, in order to reach the 2022 and 2027 deadlines, our country has committed to, with the Minimata Convention, more miners would have to change their recovery techniques from amalgamation to use improved mineral recovery um, equipment and government and regulatory bodies, miners and other stakeholders would have to work together to develop strategies to overcome these barriers. And that is what we're doing here at the moment. Thank you. Uh, pleasant good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as the slide suggests, jumping right in, um, we're exploring the topic of mainstreaming mine restoration in Guyana's extractive sector. Now, unlike previous uh, sessions or, or presentations, today we're not going to be looking at the hard science of the work we do at the GGMC. Today, um, we're more or less treating this as an information sharing session to show you what we are doing, how we're doing it, uh, but more so from the educational and awareness standpoint. Um, we're going to look at some challenges uh, for mainstreaming, the approach we've adopted at GGMC or the ED specifically on this subject talk about some educational tools that we use, uh, the level of interactions we've gotten, some of the findings from our education and awareness sessions, as well as some of our CAP surveys. Uh, we'll get into that a bit more as we, we go through the process. Um, some of the shaping factors, some of those factors that we believe uh, kind of shape the situation we're in at this point in time. And we're also going to share quickly some, uh, some activities that we've been up to. Uh, within the reclamation unit. So we've identified three core blocks of challenges for the mainstreaming process, and they're very simple. Um, limited and poor understanding of the rules that are out there. Um, inadequate um, education or the institutional capacity to get to every single minor at an instant. And overall poor compliance. Um, literally one, two, three. The approach that GGMC essentially takes in so far as his work is concerned is educate, encourage, then enforce. Most times GGMC gets the bad rap for being the enforcer, the goal police. So we decided to, well, specifically from the ED's position, to focus a lot on the educational aspect as well as the encouragement aspect. Um, our, our stakeholders in the mining sector um, require constant engagement um, to get things done, but we don't want it to always seem as though the big stick method is, is, a, is, is the, o the only way. We believe that if miners have access to the information, therefore they shouldn't have an excuse as to why you're not implementing what is in the law, especially when it's very simple and very clear. And that's what we try to do with some of these tools. So the importance of the CAP survey and the education awareness surveys, um, well, outreaches that we, we, we undertake. So it's an opportunity to address the core challenges we identified earlier. Um, we're able to also establish a baseline or a reference level for future assessments uh, we would do. There's an opportunity for value for money. In other words, we will be able to measure how we as GGMC are actually reaching miners, especially with this renewed call for more 
technical assistance or, or more of an extension type of interaction with minors, not just compliance. Uh, the data that I'll present, and again, please forgive me, this is not a technical paper, but we're just showing you um, the data we collected over time in this specific type of work. Uh, we're also able to support um, objective decision making and planning, and also identify any other gaps that may exist in our interaction. Please excuse the, the little shift. Um, some of the tools we use are very simple, very straightforward, posters. We use um, booklets. This is one of two booklets we've, we've created. I want to take two seconds to, to focus on this one. This booklet focuses or emphasizes heavily on the small and medium scale minors, a very important category. This booklet is literally the cheat sheet for, for small and medium scale minors. Why I say this is, is that it's a tool that is designed to help you rate your compliance while you mine. So you're able to rate your own performance. And just to take two seconds, the booklet covers about six to seven sections. And it starts with some of the more fundamental requirements insofar as our regulation. And if you were able to look at number one, it asks, um, if the GM has any training, number two, it would ask if the DREAD is licensed for the year. And what we would do with this tool is that we would give it to the GM or the DREAD owner. And it's something you keep. So as part of our education and awareness sessions with the minors, we literally go through this booklet from top to bottom. And we leave the tool with you and you're able to rate yourself. And as the years goes by, or the year um, ends, you're able to see where you're weak and improve it. And it's a tool you get to, to keep. So naturally, when um, the folks from the compliance uh, section comes in, you should not have an excuse as to why you're not registered. There shouldn't be any excuse as to why not. Sometimes you get an excuse, for example, me neighbor got a tongue. It's as simple and straight as that. Me, me neighbor got the tongue. I did feel at the back here, and me neighbor got the tongue. All right, the other booklet, this is the all you need to know booklet uh, with respect to mine restoration in Guyana. It's available online, it's free of cost. This booklet we would also give to the miners, and these two tables, we picked it out because we felt like it speaks to some of the like the kind of norms or barriers we have when we communicate with minors or any other stakeholders. And that's perhaps misunderstandings and who's responsible for what. So the first table um, in chapter three shows GGMC's role. The second half of the table shows what the miners' role um, in this subject of, or on this subject of uh, mines restoration. The other table shows um, some of the misconceptions around mining. Um, sorry, you're not able to see it, but for example, one of the questions there or the misconception is that restoration is, the, is GGMC's responsibility. Um, it, it's first and foremost the responsibility of the miner. Some of the data we have will kind of support this, um, but we'll see as we go. Um, before I forget, we have some of these booklets available. Um, if you're interested in, in, in any, please uh, feel free to signal. We have also demonstration sites. So we erected what we call information dashboards at each demonstration site. So let's say you're randomly in Peruni, and you see a sign that says this way to GGMC demonstration site. You could just follow the road until you find it, and then you could read about what was happening there, when the site was commissioned, what we did, the, the depth of the b biggest pit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these are billboards that will soon be erected. We were supposed to do that during mining week, um, but it's a ticklish process. What you're looking at here um, is information regarding where did we go from 2021 to 2022. Uh, this, this data does not include the work we've done this year, um, but it should give you a feel of, of, of how we function. This, so this basically show where we went and when with each, within each district and each sub-area within the, the district. So between 2021 to 2022, um, we interacted with 
about 231 mines operations. Right next to that, you'll see the amount of miners we interacted with. And you could uh, also see the amount of educational tools that we distributed. I didn't uh, mention CDs, but we also give CDs to miners who are keen on having CDs. Flash drives are a bit expensive nowadays, so we try to keep it um, a bit simple. Um, this is some information for the Northwest District. What we're trying to show here is how we are able to track how many people we interact with at the district level. So within this district for that year, um, we interacted with about 27 mine operations. And again, you could see the amount of miners we interacted with. And we also show uh, the amount of educational tools we, we, we distributed. Again, we're able to track at the level of the dredge. So no two dredges have the same number. And when we give this information to the GM or the dredge owner, we document that so you can say that you know, we never came to you or we never gave you this information. So what we did, we were able to use you know, some basic toolkits in GIS to show the red or the brown is essentially how we were able to represent the mining hotspots within Northwest. And the green is essentially the coverage we've, 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 we've made so far for that year. We're a very small unit. We also work with other divisions, but this is a process, as you know, will take some time before we get to each and every miner. The, the Zoom tab is kind of blocking some of the information, but again, we're trying to show how much miners we engaged versus how many mines operations we engage per the respective districts. Very simple, very straightforward uh, table. And this is for a one year period. This is one year of work. Uh, this is a similar, um, a similar graphic focusing largely on the, on the educational tools. Interestingly enough, uh, only the folks in the Northwest District were, were more keen on having um, CDs. Everything else was booklets and posters. So the findings for CAP survey. Um, we interacted with about 78 uh, dredge owners. 78 uh, dredge managers, 161 dredge owners, and we have the total persons for that year. I think it froze. Yeah, so we, we literally checked at the level of each mine, we asked or we checked to see how many miners or how many between the dredge manager and the dredge owner who was trained versus who had undergone no form of training. We examined who would have received information about restoration or not. And again, this is by designation between the GM and the dredge owner. These, we believe, are the two key persons as they're the one who is leading the operation. By designation again, um, who or which one of them they're familiar with uh, the restoration process. We ask who is familiar with the codes of practice for mines restoration and closure. And these are some of the uh, responses. We also ask whether they believe restoration is beneficial for the environment. Everybody chanted, yes, they believe um, restoration is safe and accept two, two persons. Um, do you believe that restoration could be done progressively throughout the life of the mind? This was a relatively interesting um, question because we did have a, some stakeholders who believe that this work cannot be done while mining is done. And actually, the language of the laws and the guidance that the laws give allows for restoration to be done progressively. 
Whether you believe restoration is mandatory by the law. Um, again, we have some persons who don't believe that this is mandatory. Who do you think is responsible for mine restoration? We have some miners clearly understanding, or the majority, the dredge owners understanding that it's the miners' responsibility. Um, some folks think it's the government's responsibility, not specific to any agency. We have some thinking it's um, EPA's responsibility. And, um, well, a few people um, think it's GGMT's responsibility. Where do you think it's important? Again, we have uh, the majority of folks agreeing that it's important. But most importantly, the last, the last um, row, we didn't ask them whether they practice restoration. We actually observed it. So we didn't ask that question. So despite some folks saying it's important, uh, it's the miner's responsibility, we had under 50% of each person or each, each mine that we visited for that year practicing restoration. We had um, a significant amount of persons being trained. The knowledge seems to be relatively low, which means we have to do more work there. But we could see the attitude is generally positive, at least based on the time they interacted with us. Because maybe we do a compliance exercise and we go back and nobody wants to talk to us. That's, that's just how the work goes. Um, what does this data suggest? Um, there's a correlation between um, miners who receive information versus those who don't, and those who actually practice um, was on the ground. Um, there's a limited access to information. That's, that's recognized. But we're working to change that by taking the information to miners. Uh, most areas in the Bagdam is connected now, and, and everything we do and share is, is we have virtual copies available. It seems as though a lot of miners are practicing what they learned from their partner before, or what they learned from the previous judge before. Rastaman, all them things you telling me about them on the paper, the nice ball. We got to get his goal. That's the language you use, use here, you know? And as I put in the text, the some of them said, this is how we know to do it, you know. Um, so we have to do a lot of work there. Some people are just disinterested. Some people would prefer to lean more on misinformation. Um, there's an overall need for greater institutional collaboration. And this is why we want to look at the attitude and practice across the board. Um, we're not knocking our minors. We recognize that they need assistance, and that is why we, we took this education and encouragement support. Sparman, they're in the corner, they're watching me with a slight side eye. It's okay, Sparman. And also, in some instances, there's an abuse of the loopholes. Miners know, especially that the, the small and medium scale miners, they know that the reclamation bond is, is low, and you know, we'll just forfeit 100,000 rather than go through all this, this, this headache. Um, just wrapping up, the assumption we have within our division is the more information that is simplified, supported by a strong field presence, we expect this to translate to an increased level of knowledge, an increased positive attitude, and better practice among our miners. And again, this is what the miners are asking for. They're asking for more education awareness and more outreaches, which is exactly what we're doing. These are the last two slides. Um, some of the, our recent activities, um, we would have commissioned well, what is Guyana's first large-scale nursery for native uh, forest species. This is a collaboration between GFC and GGMC. We refer to these, um, these units as GFC, GGMC, National Forest Restoration Station. So exclusively native forest species are produced here. And the idea is to make this a hub across the, the, the country where we have a, a seedling bank available of hardened native species. GGMC, despite its best effort, has come under some amount of criticism for you know, efforts in the past. So we've collaborated with, with, with GFC now to, you know, transition that headache to them. Um, 
we we do <laughs> no that's all right we do go on these exercises together uh, my unit has some enthusiastic young people so we do go out and collect seedlings with them pot them and so on because we want everybody to get a feel we trained about 29 individuals including some youth in natural resources along with some other officers from the forestry training center training center rather um, this year, we built two more nurseries, uh, two more sealing stations, one in Bartica, one in Linden. Uh, and in Linden, um, we are undertaking probably one of the bigger restoration efforts at one go. Uh, we expanded the Dakura site uh, to about, or by about six to seven acres. And this was this year alone. So the sealing station in Linden will support the revegetation program um, at Linden. Thank you so much. Renee and Shamita, if you would join Mr. Scott. We thank all presenters. This was, an, as I promised you, a very interesting afternoon, and I'm sure you have lots of questions. I don't think we're going to take all of them because of the hour of the afternoon, but whoever wants their own on the floor quickly, go first. And here we go. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and all the activities you are leading here in, in Guyana. Uh, I have a question for everyone, but mainly for, for you, René. Uh, regarding the example of, um, you spoke about the several restoration uh, projects around Campbell Town, maybe. So can you tell us more about this uh, restoration project? And what about the obstacles, the problems, maybe you, you found obstacles? Uh, problems, yeah, obstacles, yeah. <laughs> You, you had to face uh, to, for the implementation of this uh, restoration project. And what do you mean exactly by restoration? Because there is a big difference between restoration and revegetalization. Yeah. Between um, restoration is, should be different from uh, ve vegetalization. Revegetation, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So just to clarify, maybe I didn't, I wasn't clear in the presentation, is there was actually no restoration, act, active restoration work that was done in Campbelltown. What, what we did with the village uh, as part of the village planning process and our engagement with the village, uh, in the village planning process, the, the community identified restoration as a priority for the village. So they want, and they still do, because we've, that was in 2019. Two weeks ago, we were in the village and we revised this village, their village plan, and it's still a priority. And so what we were working with the village on was to set the stage for actual restoration activity. So which included identifying the area, that, and they identified an area, I'll come back to that in a moment, and what we were doing with the University of Guyana and uh, Boise State University, we were collecting baseline data to, on, I mean, insect diversity, that's with Eric Stahl. We had someone from GFC also doing work on um, trees. Uh, we, we test mercury within the area because the village also is thinking about production activities, doing agriculture, and obviously if there's mercury, will be an issue. Um, but we also, we kind of map the area and so on. And the idea was we were going to then work with GGMC and other partners to look at the, op the options for restoration. So this was a baseline. So priorities by the village then kind of setting the baseline for restoration. But what subsequently happened, which I think is a big issue with restoration around mining in Guyana, is the village had identified the area and agreed on it as a village but a miner, individual miner, was doing some 
was battling in the area, basically, doing some punting, and he found, well, he eventually became a stringer. He found gold, and there was a big there was rush to the area. So they had, GGMC actually had to go in and shut down what was happening. There were people with excavators working on top of each other. It got very dangerous. Basically, it was a shout. So the, that kind of um, signal to us, and GGMC could talk more about this, is when you're looking at the flow chart on areas, like to make the, de the decision tree for restoration, one of the first questions, I think is the first question in the decision, de decision tree is, is the driver of the deforestation, in this case is forest restoration, is the driver still there? And clearly the driver was still there and we didn't really, you know, the, the fact that the, the miners, even though it was a mined out area actually, the village said that they're finished mining the area, there was still gold there. And it comes back to the re issue of recovery and prospecting and recovery. Because if you're, if the tail ends or the back sands as they call it, if they still has gold, they'll still go back and mine as we found out, you know, luckily for us before any restoration activities have started. Uh, as I said, the village is still interested. So we're going to look, go through the process again and see what is possible. I think the, it, what we're interested in with the village is natural regeneration as opposed to uh, active kind of, you know, what we saw that's happening in Linden. So we're basically giving the forest a helping hand. But we are still in early, uh, an early phase for this. I don't know if Godfrey wants to say something. Yeah, but it's very, yeah, we, if there's gold there, they'll go back and mine the area. Right. So um, maybe, I, I haven't used any kind of privileges as yet. I want to maybe exercise one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the uh, restoration recognition element is something that I'd seen uh, in the large scale context before, um, observing OMAI. Uh, so I, I have a kind of a background in mining. That was my first job actually as a chemist and, and, and then environmentalist, um, which I was before anyway. Uh, and observing the transition from about 1998 to 2005, uh, when 2005, 2006, when mining would have ended and they started their own restoration bit. And part of it was fed by, I, I wondered about the insect assessment versus something like bats and rodents because they actually moved the seeds and the, any benefit that we saw in Omai's uh, reclamation, which was kind of just left, they just put back on fertile topsoil over rocks and grass grew. And it went through uh, a succession very rapidly to start getting trees because bats were bringing things out from the forest that was surrounding it. So there were some, some particular uh, parameters that had to be met um, to really allow for that to happen. And part of it was a native forest right nearby um, and the whole thing not being smashed. But I have a question uh, uh, about the work GGMC is doing. You said that um, there were uh, persons who were, uh, I think it was a question about who should pay for restoration, who should do the restoration. And um, well, most people said it was the government, or was that it? Or it was government and, and um, the, the miners. Some people said it was the miners' responsibility or their responsibility. Others thought it was the government. Some thought it was EPA. Some thought it was GGMC. But, but the, was the, is the EPA and GGMC a disaggregation of the government? Or no, 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 it's just we presented the information as they responded. Okay. You know, so we didn't we didn't take it upon ourselves to you know do any sort of right. ads or minus. We presented the information as they responded. So I wondered about what the figures would look like if you just brought because GGMC and government just uh, GGMC and EPA are just specific elements of the government that really all meant the government should do it. And I wonder what the figure would look like at that because I think that's a truer picture of it. Um, and when you said that people were practicing um, restoration at what level? I, I wondered about whether or not it was um, trying to go to reforestation, uh, trying to encourage that, even if it's on uh, some line of succession, and just ensuring that you have the material for things to grow, or is it just flattening out back the land and you know removing the 
the erosion um, uh, kind of a system that, that normally leads to continuous that way? Yeah, so first thing to identify is these respondents were mostly medium and small scale operators. And when we observed their operation, they were doing simple things like isolating the topsoil and designating a place for it, extracting the ore and doing progressive backfilling. Um, in other words, when they move tailings from, the tailings from one pond is placed into the previous pond before. And it's, it's as simple as that, you know? So as they mine, they, they made an effort to put their tailing or their waste into the, into the previous pit. So perhaps my final question, comment kind of thing, because I also knew that after the, the reclamation that was happening or the restoration was happening at that site at, at Omai, there was a shout right around the area. And the same thing Rene was describing was happening. People went in and decimated areas that were being restored. I mean, what kind of, is that an issue that GGMC is grappling with and how exactly might you? So with these, these sites that we have, they're demonstration sites. We only at the Madia demonstration site, we've, we've had that issue of raiding and so on. Um, but I would say at the majority of our, mine, our demonstration sites, we, we don't have that issue. We ensure that the site is closed and the site has been mined. Um, so there's really no turning back. And we also have a legal instrument in place that you have to go through the GGMC before anything else uh, is done on that property. The only demonstration site we've had that issue with um, raiding would, would be our St. Elizabeth demonstration site. All right, I'm going to thank you ladies and gentlemen. Uh, all our presenters for the day. Uh, it's been a very, very uh, educational um, day for us, um, but we do need to wrap it up. Uh, for those who are going to be around for another five minutes, I encourage you to have some bilaterals if you still have some questions and you would like them answered. Thank you very much, Mr. Scott, Mr. Tom, and uh, Mr. Edwards for your presentations, and I will hand you over to our main chair for the day. Mr. Calvert and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, he, he's been talking about my age on <laughs> 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 All right. So uh, thank you again, everyone. Uh, I want to echo uh, what Shanri is saying. Um, it's been a great day of engagement. Um, tomorrow is uh, going to be a more impactful day in terms of the discourse we begin with. So I encourage you to come out uh, tomorrow early again. I'm, I'm very grateful. I think at 8.15 there were some people coming in already, and, 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 and that showed some level of uh, significant interest and commitment it is. So I encourage that we come out so that we can get an on-time start. I think everything is in place today, so we don't have to have any delay tomorrow except for an act of God. Um, we will begin on time. Uh, we'll do a review of the main points from today uh, and set the pace for uh, discourse uh, in the four groups. Um, if we have sufficient persons online, we will uh, try to engage them also to mirror the groups that we will have here. But we really would, because the, 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 the real uh, richness of the engagement happens in person, that's why we are pushing for an in-person event with the critical um, uh, folks. Uh, but if there's sufficient interest maintained online, we will mirror that. Uh, so, again, uh, we look forward to your um, uh, continued engagement uh, throughout tomorrow morning and into the afternoon when we have the wider stakeholder uh, engagement. And uh, we should see some, I think, we're already seeing some very significant ideas coming to the floor. It's a matter of shaping those out and then taking them to the next level. All right? Phenomenal day, phenomenal work. Thank you to all of the, pres the presenters, and uh, thanks to Lawrence. Thanks to all the persons that were supporting uh, with the registration and our rapporteurs. See you guys tomorrow. Have a good sleep.